The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Hi. I'm Scott Benton, and today we're going to talk with James Welch, the author of Killing Custer, a personal experience regarding the Battle of the Little Bighorn, the history of the Western Indian conflict with the United States Army, and uh, the Indian culture today, as, uh, as it is perceived looking backward to that dramatic moment on the Little Bighorn when the hunter-gatherer era of the Indians of North American continent ended. Welcome. Thank you. Delighted you're here. And I thought we might start out by taking a look at the, the, some of the larger questions implicit in revisiting the Bighorn. Why do you think the Indian side of the story has not been as fully known well, I think it's pretty much axiomatic that the victor always writes the history uh, uh, of a particular era. And uh, even though the Indians won at Little Bighorn, it was their last uh, victory, at least for the Northern Plains Indians. Uh, and, and within a year, they were all on reservations, with the exception of Sitting Bull's Band, which went to Canada for four years. Um, and, and so the, the white people uh, eventually triumphed and, and eventually wrote the history of the period. Was there an early history from the Indian standpoint back, let's say, in the late 19th century? Did any Indian scholar come along and begin to tell that story? Not really. Uh, I think most of them uh, occurred in the 20th century, uh, after the turn of the century, uh, and, and certainly not written by any Indian scholars, written by um, white men who uh, were told, they, they had interviewed the survivors uh, at, at that time, who were then probably men in their uh, 60s, 70s, 80s. And, uh, and they, uh, two or three of them wrote accounts of the battle uh, from the point of view of the Indians, but, but quite often the accounts were romantic, they weren't very accurate. Um, and they weren't very well documented. So, so most people tended to either dismiss them or take them with a grain of salt. Uh, some people might consider this revisionist history. And we talked a little bit about that, that this is filling in a gap, but I wish you'd comment on that. Yeah, I, I really uh, consider it more to be a history written um, um, not only from the traditional historical side, but also from the side uh, that really hasn't been heard from much, but, but has a very legitimate um, uh, place in, in the history of that period. Uh, you know, you can look at one group of people, for instance, the Indian people, and you can say, okay, I'm going to write your history now, uh, as I perceive it, or as we perceive it from my point of view our point of view. Uh, what I try to do is to be right with the Indian people and write it from that uh, particular viewpoint. And, and uh, it's, it's very legitimate. You know, there are accounts uh, which can be documented. And, and uh, so their side, the Indian side of the story uh, uh, is interesting and can be um, quite legitimate. Um. I'm struck when you talk about the differing ways of viewing the same thing from the Indian side and from, from the uh, Yankee side or wherever you want to characterize it. And I don't know which one, which, which Indian chief this was, but they had asked him, how long did the f main fight take with Custer? And uh, from the Army side, it was the battle commenced at 1215 and ended at 145 or whatever it happened to be. And his comment was, not having a watch and not caring a darn about watches, I presume, that it took about as long as it takes an average guy to eat his dinner. Yeah. Which, to <clears throat> me, was a very neat way of phrasing the Indian reality. Yeah, there was quite a difference. Uh, <clears throat> that was uh, Two Moons, a Cheyenne war chief, that said it took about as long as it takes for a hungry man to eat his dinner. And, uh, 
Another participant said it took about as long as it takes for the sun to travel the width of a lodgepole. Uh, yeah, time for Indians was very metaphorical and, and based on events and, uh, you know, the time to water the horses or, uh, or turn them out or something. Um, so, yeah, they didn't have that notion of, of time as <coughs> these minute units and, and all the variations on that. One of the things that struck me, uh, I'm the first time that I got caught up, I think, in the, the drama of the Little Bighorn was reading Cyrus Townsend Brady. You may, you may, he wrote a series of popular Indian fights and fighters uh -huh. from a very biased standpoint. Although he wasn't, he'd put the facts down. His conclusions uh, would be suspect today, but the facts mm -hmm. were generally correct. And then shortly after I read that, I saw Errol Flynn in They Died With Their Boots On. Mm -hmm. Now the central image of that is Errol Flynn standing alone at the end surrounded by hundreds of whooping warriors uh, shooting with his six-shooter bravely until the moment of the final death. And it, at no time in that movie, I think Anthony Quinn played Crazy Horse if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, and he was a good heavy. Right. He always could be a menace and he was always perceived as a menace in this movie. N never once did that film or Cyrus Townsend Brady or any of the early events get into the fact that these people were sitting in a village not doing anything belligerent, having a social moment together and not planning on moving on the army or moving on the local settlements. They just were out for a good buffalo hunt and a last hoorah. And that to me is very, very touching and also makes me let's say culturally, if not ashamed, certainly uncomfortable with the way we've treated the event. Mm -hmm. uh, you do a moment that is, I think, uh, based on your skill as a, as a novelist, setting the scene standing at the moment now when you visited the site of mm -hmm. that village and just describing it, how it looked now and imagining almost poetically what it was at that past moment. Yeah, I tried, uh, in the, <clears throat> the book I tried to uh, uh, portray the village as, uh, it was three miles long and uh, it was populated by human beings and uh, so I, I compare it somewhat to, to a big campground, you know, and, and try to think of people doing arts and crafts, you know, uh, uh, making a bow and arrow uh, uh, or or tanning a hide or or uh, drying meat cutting meat into strips to dry on racks uh, the children be out playing uh, the girls would be playing with either dolls or or, or um, hoops and sticks and the boys would be shooting bows and arrows young men would be courting young women and mothers would be telling stories to their children old ones would so I tried to <coughs> portray this as kind of a big camp full of human beings who are very peaceful. It's a very peaceful moment, and it was. The day got up to be 100 degrees, but uh, at that moment, <coughs> under the shade of the cottonwood trees with the river rushing by, it was a very peaceful moment. And then an old man starts crying out, uh, soldiers are here, soldiers are here, young men go out and fight them. And, you hear these bullets whizzing by, as one man describes it, like angry bees. And just the terror that this village must have felt as, as they came under attack uh, uh, must have been just immense uh, for the women, the children, the old ones. And, and I try to uh, uh, portray that moment in a novel, or I mean in the, the uh, book. Um. Looking back on and the history that immediately preceded that in the Plains Wars, thinking that I'm going to pronounce the name wrong, probably. Is it Washita or Washita? I've always said Washita. Okay, I'll go with Washita. Okay. It sounds better to me anyway, for some <laughs> reason or other. But in that battle in 1868, Custer attacked a village in the winter, and women and children were killed deliberately. That was well known to the Indians. They, and in fact, that wasn't the only incident of its kind. The Sand Creek Massacre and others were, right. were a, a, a Holocaustian approach to settling the Indian problem. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that was well known to the, to the people there at, uh, at on the Bighorn. Yes, it Widely was pretty known. well known. Uh, the Washita was well known, which occurred in 1868. The uh, massacre at Sand Creek, which I believe was 1864. Uh, incidentally, both those events involved the same Indians, the same Southern Cheyennes, and um, uh, so the people up north knew about these events. They knew about the massacre on the Marias River, which happened in 1870, which is uh, what I describe in the book to actually begin the book, because it happened to my own people, the Blackfeet, and uh, which 173 Indian people, men, women, and children, were killed. So they were well aware of uh, uh, this idea of um, removing the Indians from this country by any means possible, even if it meant slaughtering them. I mean, even if it meant genocide. Uh, uh, it was estimated that um, uh, in in the uh, mid 19th century there were like five million Indian people in the contiguous United States area. Uh, by 1900, there were 238,000 Indians left. So I don't that think in North America. In, in well, in the United States part of North okay. America. So uh, it becomes clear a lot of them died of diseases that they weren't prepared for, especially smallpox. But also they were wiped out. It wasn't um, uh, beyond any stretch of imagination to believe that a policy of genocide, even if it was unspoken, uh, was, was part of the overall strategy to remove Indians. Uh, there's a Phil Sheridan, who was the general in charge of that area, the Civil War hero, uh, apparently had a policy that was strike them in the winter when they were holed up and uh, in their camps, and then you could get them all at once rather than have to chase them around when they can get on horseback and get away from you, mm -hmm. uh, which seemed to me to be a pretty cold-blooded uh, assessment of trying to, to resolve a, a cultural conflict. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> he did have that policy, uh, and it worked. You know, it was a terrific policy uh, as, a, as military strategy because the Indians didn't expect attacks in the winter time. They were bundled up in their camps. Previous to that, the uh, army always tried to attack them in the spring, summer, or fall when the weather was good, and the Indians were very mobile, and 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 so they could never quite have this big confrontation that they they always sought. And so when Custer attacked the um, uh, Southern Cheyenne people uh, at the Washita, uh, he was uh, the first practitioner of Sheridan's uh, theory that in the wintertime the Indians would be bundled up, and, and it worked perfectly. Um, and yet here at the Big Horn, it's in June, uh, but with three columns moving towards this grand convocation of Indians. Uh, and catching them. Uh, mm. Did they have a sense? Did they know that was the last moment because of the buffalo was vanishing and so forth? Yes, they, they really did. <clears throat> when Sitting Bull issued his invitation uh, for all the Indians to come and join them, and especially the reservation Indians. Some Indians had been on reservations for eight years already. and. Um, he said, uh, come on out, we'll all get together, we'll have a good time. And uh, some accounts say that we'll have one last big fight with the whites, too. Um, but people just came, and, and even at the time of the battle, on uh, June 25th, Indians were still arriving from the reservation. So everybody responded, and, and it made for a huge village. and, and I think their main goal is to get together to have, as you say, this convocation, this grand reunion, to hunt buffalo, to, to just live in the old way, because Sitting Bull and the other leaders knew that that way was just about over. So there was a great poignance then, a sense of poignance, that the sun was setting on that part of their existence, and the young people had no place to go. If they weren't going to be able to embrace the old culture, uh, yeah. they were faced with a, not just an unknown future, but a bleak future. Uh, 
How did the Indians at that time feel about life on a reservation? Well, life on a reservation was just uh, horrible. Uh, <clears throat> this was during Grant's administration, and and there was much corruption uh, during that administration. Indian agents, uh, suppliers, even uh, people as far up as the uh, Seward. Uh, he was in Grant's cabinet. Uh, Grant's brother Orville was involved in this corruption. Uh, in which everybody got kickbacks, and and uh, one of the things was they sold supplies to other people rather than the Indians. They would get the supplies and sell them el elsewhere. So to the Indians, rations were always in short supply, and uh, most of the time when they did get through, they were unfit to eat. So consequently, Indians just uh, starved to death on these reservations. Uh, it was very awful period in American history. There was another a simple kind of uh, <clears throat> oh, uh, logic that seems to have been defied in looking at Dakota. We all know now that if you farm Dakota, you better have a ton of land and grow wheat or some other grain. And yet the Indians on the Standing Rock and Pine Ridge were, so, or Pine Ridge were told, here's 160 acres and turn it into a truck farm. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, you can make some excuse, I suppose, for the fact that th they were just learning about the realities of living on the high plains. But the Indians had lived there for a long time, and even though they were hunters and gatherers, they also had had some crops. But mm -hmm. how familiar were they? Were they making the turn into, into uh, an agricultural life? No, they weren't. Um, <clears throat> that was the farthest thing from their mind, uh, agriculture, except for some of the uh, people like the Mandans and the uh, Arikaras and some of the people who lived in the Missouri River Valley permanently. But most, as you say, most of them were hunters, gatherers. Uh, uh, some people call them uh, nomads or roamers. Uh, they did plant crops in certain places, like they would plant a tobacco crop and go away and then they'd come back and harvest the tobacco, but, but it was just a little plot for personal or ceremonial use. Um, so when they were given the 160 acres under the Dawes Act, uh, they were given shovels, they were given hard-toed hard shoe, shoes, and uh, told to go out and plant a crop. And, and you know they didn't know how to do it. 160 acres, as you say, wasn't nearly enough land, so they were destined to fail, and when they failed, um, uh, people said it was because they were lazy, they didn't uh, care, and, and so on. So the stereotypes kicked in then, and uh, and just tarred them with, with this uh, brush that said uh, they weren't real Americans, they couldn't make it. Uh, there's a personal question about the fact that you were raised up uh, on a Blackfoot reservation? The Blackfeet. Mm -hmm. Blackfeet, excuse me. Right. <laughs> uh, I'll get the hang of it in a minute. Right. Uh, and they would show movies at Browning, Montana, is that it? Mm -hmm. There had to be a theater there then. And you would see They Died With Their Boots Down, or you name the Western, where the tall Gary Cooper rides in, or Randolph Scott. And uh, the bad guy is very usually played by an Italian actor, by the way, yeah. <laughs> Joseph Calia, or any one of a number of Italian yeah, actors. Were, sure. <laughs> yes, and or Leo Carrillo, or I'm, I'm thinking, well, you name it, yeah. uh, of guys that played, that made a living playing Indians, and nobody ever bothered to ask the Indians, who can, turned out to be very good actors too. And we just found that out in the last ten years. Uh -huh. But here would be a bunch of Indian kids, let's say, on Saturday afternoon in a movie theater, watching something where very clearly the stereotypes were carefully drawn. There were the good guys, and they wore hats, and they had spurs, and they had saddles, and they were going west. Mm -hmm. And there were those guys lurking around in the bushes that didn't wear very good clothes, and they weren't very well armed, and okay. somehow or other they were very menacing. Now, what happened in that theater among those kids in, in terms of relating or not relating to those movies? Because that was about yeah. all they were, by the way. I'm describing a typical film, I think. Yes. Uh, uh, well, this was in the late 40s, very early 50s. And 
the uh, settlers would be under attack by a large horde of savages, and I'll put quotes on that. Yeah. And uh, uh, the savages are shooting flaming arrows into the house, and the family is singing a, a hymn, their last hymn that the, before the end. And you hear a sudden, you hear the faint notes of a bugle, mm -hmm. and you hear some thundering hoofbeats, and pretty soon you see the cavalry coming, and, and they're <laughs> riding at breakneck speed, and all the uh, uh, people in the audience would cheer. And as I mentioned in the book, it was only when the lights came up that, and you looked around, you realized that these were all Indian faces cheering the cavalry, which was coming to punish the Indians in the movie. They understood the drama, but not the history. No, no, the uh, consciousness hadn't been raised at that particular time. The central figure that we saw on saloon posters and in movies and in stories for below these many years, or over 120 years almost now, is George Armstrong Custer, mm -hmm. who uh, was very much a creature of the period. Uh, but what, uh, what do you think, what, what, what were the forces that made George Custer what he was? <clears throat> well, I, I think that he is a more complicated man than people get him, give him credit for. Uh, I don't think he is purely a hero. I don't think he is purely a fool. Uh, he was somewhere in between there. How uh, about villain? A uh, villain? Yeah, well, he was certainly a villain to Indian people. Uh, when he led the expedition into the Black Hills in 1874, uh, the Indians called that the, the, the Thieves' Trail and Custer the King of the Thieves. So the Indians had no use at all for him. So. Two Indian people, yes, he was the villain. I don't know, in a psychological way, I mean, if one were to analyze Custer, um, I suppose you'd find a person who was ambitious, who was probably insecure. Uh, when, when he was young, when he was a child, his mother, he was raised by his mother and then an aunt, they used to dress him in dresses, and, uh, you know, and, and he would have long golden locks. and. Uh, I think maybe that kind of followed him around <laughs> in his adult adulthood and maybe made him want to prove himself as a man. He was complicated. Extraordinary uh, story of his wife who lived on so many years, didn't die till 1933 or 1927, anyway, well into this century, and uh, spent her life apparently uh, throwing roses at his memory and uh, writing books about it, and some of which were bestsellers. Oh, yes. Uh, she died. Uh, with the fortune of a hundred thousand dollars, which was a was a fortune in those days, I that lived much. on Park Avenue. Uh, yeah, on Park Avenue in New York, and uh, probably idolized socially. Yes, she was, and and her whole purpose for fifty years, she outlived George by fifty years, was to um, uh, keep his memory green with uh, young people, with generations, so that they would always think of Custer as this great hero. Uh, she, and she succeeded. Uh, she, along with Buffalo Bill, who in his Wild West show uh, uh, had a, a portion devoted to the battle, recreation of the Battle of Little Bighorn, and he played to all the crowned heads of Europe as well here as here in the States. So between the two of them, they kept Custer's memory alive, and they cr really created, along with the poets, uh, the Custer myth. Uh, what? Influence do you think that battle and its memory has on the Native Americans today? Uh, the battle itself, I think, is kind of a pleasant memory to to Indians. <laughs> we you won know. one, right? Yeah, they won one. And uh, but but what I noticed in talking to the Indian elders and other people on on the various reservations we visited uh, was that they tended to focus more on their losses. Uh, the Sioux or Lakota people would focus on uh, the treacherous murders of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull and on the uh, massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890. The Northern Cheyenne people focused more on uh, the attack by the army on Dolnax Village six months after the uh, Battle of the Little Bighorn, in which many people were slaughtered um, as in the wintertime Many people eventually froze to death or starved to death and so on. Um, I noticed that these kinds of losses uh, 
or more significant to to the Indians I talked to than than this one kind of momentary triumph which has gone down in white history as uh, uh, something I think more elevated than what actually occurred. Uh, there was, as I recall, a lot of recriminations in the army afterwards between Major Reno, I guess he was to the court martial, Captain mm -hmm. Benteen, who was no fan of of Colonel Custer. Uh, it is there's a confusion I think too about Custer, and that he's called general, but it was a brevet rank. He lost that after the Civil War. He was a lieutenant colonel. And the colonel of the regiment wasn't present. I don't know where he was, but uh, it seems to me he ran the regiment and the colonel was elsewhere. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and not everybody was massacred. There were 600 and some odd people, in the, which was an understrength regiment. I think there were 1,000 people, I think, would be a regiment. And uh, that was probably typical for Western soldiers at that point. And yet only 218 or some rather one third. sixty some. Okay. Altogether. So there was a third or maybe a bit more were actually killed and the rest of them survived. Mm -hmm. uh, well also uh, here's another point that most people don't realize when they say there were no ba no survivors of the Custer battle and when they're talking about the Custer battle they're talking about Custer's uh, companies uh, not Reno's or Ben Teams. Uh, but but uh, it I like to point out that there were probably 8,000 survivors uh, you know, on the other side. The Indians uh, survived. Only between 60 and 100 Indians got killed. So um, I think it's important, again, to strike this balance between the two sides and to uh, remember that the Indians fought there too and, and that many of them survived to, to tell their stories to their children and so on. Um, it's important to realize there were two sides. To me, th there's a parallel here. Most Americans now consider the Civil War as our conflict, and they regard with certain amount of affection both sides mm -hmm. of that conflict. They, Robert E. Lee is a, also an American hero. I think perhaps we're beginning to come to that point with the, the, the war with the Plains Indians, and mm -hmm. that the sitting bulls and the crazy horses and people of that ilk are now beginning to be embraced by the American consciousness as our American heroes. And whether there was a difference of opinion at the time, that was their problem. Now we can look at them correctly and, and, and assess them correctly. We've been talking with James Welch, author of Killing Custer, an extremely interesting and very readable story of the Battle of Little Bighorn and its impact on the Indian culture and our perception of that great conflict with the Plains Indians of 70, 80, 90, well, 100 and some odd years ago. I think Wounded Knee was... twenty years. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, it is uh, doing very well, I'm told, in the bookstores, and I can see why. I enjoyed it, and so will you. of the Hennepin County Library.